This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past. The only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now, I am just so freaking excited for today's guest because it's my 1300th guest in episode and I am talking about Lorraine Dupree. She, of course, wrote the classic episode of Dallas, Who Shot JR episode, Who Done It. And, um, you know, she was a pioneer of, 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 of uh, TV writers back in the 70s. She wrote for a lot of shows, you know, um, like Chips, Crime Story, The Waltons. Um, and she played Jane in Brian De Palma's classic underrated thriller Obsession, which celebrates 45 years this year. And we're going to talk about all of that. And she's written novels. And it's going to be a great conversation today. So yeah, here is my interview with Lorraine Dupree. Hey, Lorraine, welcome to the show. How are you today? I am fine. How are you? I am just spectacular. Thank you so much for being my 1300th guest today. This is amazing. 1300? Yep. Wow. Cool. Congratulations. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Yes, it's been a wild ride. So, going back in time, you know, you told me the other day that, you know, you grew up loving show business. At what age did you start gravitating toward acting? Oh, God. I mean, <laughs> I wanted to, when I was a little girl, I lived in a little bitty town in Louisiana. Right. And I would go to the movie theater, and I would see those actors on screen, and I thought, well, first of all, I, I believe that they were there in back of the screen. Right. In black and white. I don't know what I believed, but, uh, yeah, that's that's what I wanted to do. And then we moved to Chicago, to a suburb of Chicago, and I wanted to take acting classes, but my parents were not interested in that. Really? So they never let you do at least a school play? Well, it wasn't that. They just weren't. I, I wanted private lessons, and they were not interested in that. Sure, they they were perfectly happy, and I went to Northwestern. Mm -hmm. I studied drama, um, but I was not a star as an actress. Yeah. They, so you moved from um, Louisiana to Chicago. I've never been to, to either, but uh, my grandfather was from Chicago, and my dad was the first one to be born in California. Um, how, how amazing was it back in those days? Well, you know, I moved when I was 10 mm -hmm. for a child who grew up in a tiny little town, 2,500 people, mm -hmm. moved to a posh suburb in Chicago. It was really hard. But maybe that's what gave me the courage to go ahead and, you know, try new things. Right. And I, I imagine with a, a town with 2,500 people, there weren't a whole lot of Mardi Gras, Mardi Gras parades. <laughs> No, no Mardi Gras parades. You had to go to New Orleans for the Mardi Gras parades. Yeah. Which were, which was fantastic as a child. And then I moved back um, in my 30s and, mm -hmm. with, and I had a child. And the Mardi Gras parades were amazing. I mean, the town, New Orleans is a really special town. It's not a good town if you're very ambitious. Yeah. You just want to have fun. There's no place like New Orleans. Right. It's a nice little getaway for people, you know, who are ambitious, though, and they've accomplished a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So so you attended Northwestern University. Did you study acting there? Yes. Did, did any of your uh, classmates uh, go on to become successful in acting? Yes, but not too many. Um, Marsha Rod was kind of was a uh, star on Broadway. Right. Um, uh, and and, and uh, Penny Fuller. 
Oh, yeah. Or on Broadway and then in, uh, then on television. Right. Um, but, you know, it's, it's very hard. Um, Dick Benjamin, who, produced, oh, yeah. who direct, you know, Dick Benjamin. Yep. Um, and his wife, Paula Prentice. Paula was the first. She was picked out of Northwestern to, to star in a movie. Wow. Um, where the boys are. But um, not a lot. Well, of course, it's just that hard. Right. Many people try, and few succeed. Yeah, I mean, I've talked to a lot of people, and, you know, they, they went to uh, school with a lot of big-name people, and it's it's funny, because back then it was such a much smaller world. It's not like today with the Internet and everything. This is yeah. long before that. Yeah, well, I uh, then I, I went to Paris in my junior year abroad to kind of to get away from it. Right. Because I really wasn't a very good actor. You know, I wasn't succeeding in, in my acting classes, so I went to Paris, and then I studied art with Andre Lot, mm-hmm. who was one of the great art teachers there and one of the great painters at the time, and uh, just had adventures and lived my life. Yeah, I mean, when you were um, doing painting, though, I mean, were you trying to get your paintings sold to uh, galleries? I was learning. Mm-hmm. I, I, uh, some of my friends, I didn't want to be a painter, it turned out. Mm-hmm. I loved doing it, but the kind of life that you have to live where you're just by yourself all the time. Right. <laughs> it's just you, the paintbrush, and the easel. Yeah, yeah. Um, my boyfriend went on to, my French boyfriend went on to be uh, successful as a painter and also as a, a, a museum administrator. But nice. it just it wasn't the life for me. Yeah, I, I get it. I get it. Were you were you any good though? Apparently, I was okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I don't do it now at all. Oh, wow. So... I guess because I know so much. I studied so much, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know, modern art and art history. And when I put brush to canvas, I think, this is terrible. (laughs) (laughs) So then you you wrote educational radio. What exactly is educational radio? I don't think I've ever heard those two words in the same sentence before. Well, WBEC in Chicago at that time was the voice of the Chicago Public Schools. Right. And, um, yeah, we wrote children's shows and we wrote educational shows. I remember, I remember writing about a mall in the night visitor as a children's opera, you right. know, for Christmas time. And, um, yeah, it was before. And then I went to work for Carnet Films, which mm-hmm. made uh, educational movies. Um, wow, yeah, that's new to me. I never heard educational radio. I guess in those days, you know, every everybody did everything, <laughs> and even if it was, you know, experimental and and all of that, yeah. Yeah, well, a, a funny story. Mm-hmm. The shows weren't very good, and um, we had a um, an engineer who actually made radios for the public schools, but they would only get that station. And they were very heavy. And he told me with great pride, not one of, even though they're in the schools, not one of them has ever been stolen. And I thought, (laughs) that's because nobody wants them. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. Nobody wants them. (laughs) Um, But then I went into advertising. Yeah, what what kind of uh, products did you um, advertise for? Well, I went to, uh, because I came from the uh, Board of Education radio station, then I went into Scott Forsman. You remember Dick Jane and Sally books? Yes. And um, they did, they were one of the major textbook places, so I did educational, you know, I, 
I advertised for them, for Carnet Films, and then for um, Scott Forsman. And then I went to Paris to work on Colgate, Colgate, Colgate. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Chanel. Nice. Wow, it's funny you mentioned uh, Dick Jane and Sally books. I was um, I've been trying to find like background information on Dr. Seuss's The Cat in the Hat, which is my favorite story, right from Dr. Seuss, and I found somewhere that he was influenced by Dick Jane and Sally for it. I thought that was very interesting and stuff because it's such an original story. I mean, so many people have you know. Have, have ripped that story off, you know, of the cat in the hat since then. But I thought that was very interesting that he was influenced by Dick, Jane, and Sally. Yeah. I think what he meant was that the early, those textbooks mm -hmm. had limited words. Right. So if they had a story and they had five words in it on the beginning, or they may have had a hundred words, but they were quite limited, so they would take this, these same words and then and, and build the next story and the next. And if you see the cat in the hat, they were, he used very few words. Right. And he would repeat them and rhyme them. Yeah. It was brilliant. Yeah, it was very brilliant. It's, it's funny that um, you worked in advertising because uh, last year, you know, I interviewed... Um, the late uh, comedy writer who just passed, Ann Beats, and um, she started out in advertising as well. I guess if you can, like, come up with good advertisements, you can also uh, uh, write for television as well. Well, I think it's a, it's a personality who... Um, is a creative personality. Um, there are people who are very good at math, Right. And they can be accountants, and they can work with the numbers, and they can be scientists. And there are people who are good, and who are just creative, and who think about things, and who come up with slogans, and come up with stories, and love stories. And I think, so everything is very much like that. Can you, can you take credit for any uh, particular slogans that were popular back in the day? I'm sorry, what? Can 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 you take credit for any slogans that were popular back in the day? When your heart takes a spin, that's the sh the spell of Chanel. <laughs> that's awesome. I should I should and go. In, in French, mm -hmm. I um, the French advertising was pretty boring, so <laughs> um, I had a, a a client who was a. Um, did roofing, mm -hmm. or and in France, if you have a town, um, you all have to have the same roof in that town. It's required if you're going to build a building, uh. red brick roof, then it's everybody has red brick roof. Right. So my uh, slogan was, "We cry our success from the rooftops." <laughs> I love that. That's cool. Wow. So, uh, and I can't win. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. After Paris, I came back to New Orleans. Where right. My mother was living. And kind of, you know, went through the whole hippie thing and kind of dropped out. And then got really tired of that and came out to Hollywood. <laughs> so, how, so, how does um, obsession come into your life? Oh, yeah, that was sort of the last. When I was living in New Orleans, and it was the last uh, kind of year I was in New Orleans, and um, I got a call from an agent. said, why don't you come in and audition? And I auditioned and got the part. But, you know, it's a small part. Right. But it was, uh, it was really fun. Yeah, what, what, what did you think of the script? You know, they never let me have the script. Really? Just just your lines, that's it? I got my lines, yeah. I got pages. And that was a mistake, though, because, um, you know, when they went to the next scene, mm -hmm. 
I wasn't prepared for that. You weren't prepared for it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, I had the, I had the, the sides for the first two scenes, and then I had the third scene, and I wasn't even prepared for it. So it was, it was difficult. Um, and I, I never saw the script, the whole script. Yeah. Why they did that. Because I'm so compulsive. I would have memorized the entire thing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I heard uh, I heard certain dyslexic people they they can memorize the uh, the entire script, but yet they can't read a book. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah, like Anthony Hopkins, he's dyslexic, but he can memorize a whole script. Really, he's dyslexic. Yeah, I am mildly, my very mildly dyslexic, but I read very slowly. Yeah, my mother, she's dyslexic. She's the worst speller I have ever met in my life, and I'm the best speller in the family. And whenever she texts me and gets a word wrong, I always have to correct it. It's just an impulse I have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm very fortunate that my husband is the worst speller than I am. Otherwise, he would think I was an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God for spell check, at least an autocorrect. <laughs> oh, isn't it wonderful? Oh, yeah. I mean, sometimes it can be annoying because I know I spelled the word right, so I always have to, like, you know, disable that that part of the text I'm writing or something so I don't, you know, so, you know, it doesn't uh, annoy me, you know, when the words get un- underlined, you know, because <laughs> I know I spelled oh it right. God. Yeah, and, and sometimes, because sometimes I write in French sometimes, and I use French phrases, and I write, well, I write French in French. Mm-hmm. Um, and spell check is always trying to make it, you know, trying to to change those words. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, yeah, this movie, it really follows, like, Hitchcock's vertigo in that the leading man, you know, sees, sees a woman who looks like his wife. You know, this was like the, the, the beginning of De Palma doing these, these Hitchcock-style thrillers. Were, were you a fan of the Hitchcock movies? Yes, of course. I mean, everybody is. Yeah. And, um, and I think, you know, De Palma's a genius. Yeah, he he was coming off a of Phantom of the Paradise, and he hadn't even done Carrie yet. That was the next movie he made, and that's what kind of broke him through as a director. Uh, how, how was working with him? Because I heard he's not an actor's director. He likes to focus on the visuals and the story. That's right. Mm-hmm. Was he a, was he a good guy? Yeah. Definitely. But no, he was no. I he did not work with the actors. Yeah, he was just he had an attitude of like just do it, you know, and that's it. Yeah, we want to we want to get the I mean, he was very concerned about where the camera was. Mm-hmm. I, lo- I love the way your hair looked in the movie. It was very 70s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, what, was, was that what your hair normally looked like in those days? No, I, I'm a brunette. I know, but I mean like in the style of what it was. <sighs> no, I have really curly hair. I'm a very curly brunette. Yeah. And, and they, they uh, dyed it blonde because uh, Genevieve uh, is a brunette. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how was working with John Lithgow? He is a lovely, lovely man. Yeah. It was his first, like... Kind and so helpful, yeah. Yeah, it was like his first big movie, uh, you know, after after years of, you know, Chicago-trained, you know, theater. Uh-huh. I, I've talked to a couple... I didn't know he was from Chicago. Yeah. In fact, I've talked to people uh, who came up with him in the theater. He was in that same crew as uh, Dennis Franz and Joe Mantegna and Meshach Taylor and those guys. Yeah. That whole, that whole crew of Chicago actors. Uh, how was Cliff Robertson... Yeah, lovely. Just really a lovely guy. 
and I saw an interview he did one time. He, uh, you know, that guy had so many TV credits, right? He was doing an interview for the Archive of American Television. He did so many t TV credits. He remembered so many of them, but then there was a lot of them he didn't remember. <laughs> it's, he was, like, stumped when uh, the interviewer brought them up, you know? Oh, <laughs> I didn't, I thought of him always as a movie actor. I never thought of him as a TV actor. Oh, yeah, he guest starred on Twilight Zone, even Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Uh, he was on uh -huh. all those shows. I think he did those um, those live theater shows like Playhouse 90 and General Electric Theater and stuff. Yeah. He did. He's a lovely, lovely man. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, um, you know, this was a Columbia movie, and ironically, he sued David Beagleman uh, for keeping money for him. You know, he was the head of Columbia, David Beagleman, and... Cliff Robertson could not get a mainstream movie role for a couple of years after that because he had taken on the system. If that was today, it would probably be a lot different, but back then that was pretty pretty bad. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, yeah. Did you um, uh, talk, did you get to uh, meet or talk with, um, what's her name, uh, Genevieve Bull, or whatever her Je last name is? Genevieve Bougeau. Yeah. And not much. We weren't in the same. Um, we weren't in the same scenes. They made my hair. I I'm, was naturally a brunette. Right. And they dyed my hair blonde because of of her. Uh, but we weren't in the same scenes. I I saw her a couple of times in Malibu, but just to say hello. Oh, that's nice. How about how about Brooke Adams? Adams? No, I don't know her. Oh, okay. Yeah, she's a very talented actress. Uh, she, oh, yes. Very talented. Mm -hmm, she's married to Tony Shalhoub. I didn't know that. Yeah. Huh. He's amazing. Yeah. Everything he's in, he's great. Yeah. So, af so after that movie, is that when you moved to L.A.? Yeah. And you just... you. Were you trying to look for acting jobs and then you wound up writing? Well, you know, basically I, I realized that I was mostly a writer. Mm -hmm. I did take some uh, acting classes with... Uh, I did take some acting classes, and I think I just decided I wasn't good enough, you know. Mm -hmm. so I, was, I was older then. It was very hard in those days. There were no... There were very few women... Even in the movies, right? It would be somebody who's somebody's wife or something, right? Um, there, there weren't a, you know, there weren't a lot of, and there were a lot of people who were much better actors than I am. So, <laughs> um, but I had been writing anyway, and right. I really wanted to break into writing. Like I like I like I could see you playing you know the type of roles that Jane Alexander played you know and Jane in Obsession is a great example of that you know kind of a a, a girl Friday. Yes, yes. But you know there were a lot of, of actors, <laughs> women. Mm -hmm. My guess would be just you know when you think about high school. Yeah. If you think about your high school class, you for example. Mm -hmm. I bet there were a lot of girls trying out for the high school play, and yeah. very few guys. Uh, in my generation, we had a lot of guys and girls um, trying out for the school play, um, including a few gay guys, as a matter of fact. Uh huh. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I auditioned um, for the Sound of Music my sophomore year, and I didn't get it because I couldn't dance at all. <laughs> in high school? I, well, well, we did, okay, so we would do two musicals a year and then one, you know, just straight up play, and no, I never got anything, and so I did um, stage crew backstage, and that was a lot of fun because um, me and the other prop handlers, you know, we could just, you know, be backstage at the prop table and whisper each other dirty jokes and just have a blast to keep the boredom from, you know, being monotonous. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Uh, yes, yeah. The, the theater is really fun. Uh, it is. I did. Um, I did. So, I did some um, backstage.
prop handling for some plays in adulthood as well. And I tried to get involved in that when I moved up here to Reading. Unfortunately, it's a it's a weird conservative town, and there's a lot of politics like everywhere here, especially in the theater. And so, unfortunately, I've had to uh, sit that out, you know, since I've been up here. But I don't know; it'll it'll, it'll happen again someday. Uh, me and my mom, you know, we were born and raised in the Bay Area, and, you know, huh. Bay, Bay Area has become so capitalistic and so money-driven that, yeah. you know, the money uh, pushed us out, you know, and plus my mom was going through a very bad breakup that, that was partially uh, responsible for us being homeless uh, for a couple of years. Oh, dear. Yeah, it was a bad situation, and my car accident happened right in the middle of it, too. Yeah, so we just been up here, you know, uh, living cheap, saving money, and hoping um, next year we can move somewhere nice, and hopefully we can get a house instead of an apartment. <laughs> and fingers crossed on that. But um, so let's let's talk about your your writing credits. I, I can see that your only sitcom credit is The Love Boat. I wanted to do sitcoms. I. I did comedy pretty well. Yeah. What happened was, um, after I wrote for my Broken with Family and Love Boat, uh -huh. and what happened was, then there was a year, very shortly after that, where comedy was dead. Mm -hmm. Nobody was doing any more comedy. Nobody was creating any more comedy. And so I just went on doing dramas. And then when comedy came back, I was a drama writer. I was considered a drama writer. Uh -huh. I love comedy, and my books are funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that com writing comedy can be hard because, you know, especially if you're writing for like a late night, um, a late night, you know, talk show, right? You're you write you spend all day writing fifty jokes, and you're lucky if one of them actually makes the final product. You know. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's like that for a sitcom, but yeah, I mean, if, I mean, if you could handle that kind of writing, yeah, I mean, that's great. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure you, you, you could have written a lot of great sitcoms, you know, if had, you know, that, that era hadn't been so, you know, bad. I mean, the, 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 uh, the Gary Marshall sitcoms were great during that period and the Norman Lear ones. Oh, weren't they? Oh my God, they were fabulous. Yeah. Like, like, would you have written for those? I would have loved to have written for those. Do, do you think? Do, do you think you didn't because they they, they thought that that um, they did, they didn't want female writers; they just wanted the male ones. Well, that was part of it. I mean, yeah. that was certainly true in dramas. Um, they would talk about only women. Women could only write for soft shows, which they would say in a. Oh God! Disparaging voice. Yeah. And um, my husband went on the Equalizer. Mm -hmm. and they told me very proudly that they had never had a woman writer on the show. Love it, love it. And there were some other shows that were that was particular. Right. So it was. It, they would. When I first came to Hollywood in, um, when was that? In 75, I think it was. Right. Um, the, I, would, I joined Women in Film, and I would meet writers, and most of the women writers that I met, um, their husbands were producers, otherwise they would not have gotten jobs. I mean, it was really hard. Yeah. You wrote um, The Lazarus Syndrome. Was that a TV movie of the week or a pilot? No, oh, it was a... Lazarus Syndrome was a series. Okay. And um, it was a good series, but uh, I only wrote one episode. And then it went off the air. So um, a friend of mine was, was, one of, was on staff, and he got me the job, and I enjoyed it, because I wrote a kind of a action-adventure uh, episode in the ER, where uh, somebody, a drug addict, came into the ER and sort of taken them 
uh, hostage. But I don't know if the show was ever even produced. Uh, yeah, I didn't know if it, if it was um, you know a pilot or a movie of the week because of the context in which it was written on IMDb. Because usually, you know, they put the name of the ser- they put the name of the series and then they put the episode that the writer wrote, and it wasn't on there. So that's why I thought it was either a pilot or a TV movie. I don't know why they did that. Yeah, I, I, is 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 that still best known for Lazarus Syndrome? It just said the Lazarus Syndrome, 1979. Is that what I'm supposed to be best known for, according to IMDb? No. I wrote them. No, no, no. It's just the list of credits. <laughs> <laughs> they wrote me, and they said, well, that's what she's best known for. And I wrote them, and I said, um, I don't even think that episode was produced. Huh. And they went off the air. That's probably it. Yeah, that's probably why it was uh, written like that. Uh-huh. Then you wrote... Uh, yeah. <laughs> then you wrote an episode of The Waltons. Oh, yeah, I loved that episode. Yeah, uh, that was when Keith Coogan was on. I actually talked to him the other day, as a matter of fact. Uh-huh. Yeah, I talked to Judy Norton as well. Yeah, that... That was a that was a that was a great little family show. You know, it was on the same time as Little House in the Prairie. You know, they were kind of like, you know, contemporary shows of the of the eighteen hundreds. Then you wrote uh, three episodes of Dallas, including the most famous one. Who shot Jr. Yes, yes. I have so much to ask about this. So. Well, go ahead. <laughs> where Where did this idea come from? know the well was, I okay I do have the story for that um, when AB, uh, CBS um, you know it became such a success mm-hmm. original idea was that that um, that year the final episode would be um, I mean the year before that was written so the final episode was supposed to be Sue Ellen has a um, car accident because she's drunk. Right. And that was supposed to be the cliffhanger. And it was such a successful show that CBS said, uh, we want two more episodes. And so um, the executive producer and the um, story editor, um, they sat down and they said, well, what are we going to do because this is our cliffhanger that Sue Ellen had a car accident. What are we going to do? How can we find a better accident? Yeah. Those guys were so funny. And one of them said, I know, let's shoot JR. And it was just, that was all it was. It was just an idea. So uh, I didn't write that episode. Somebody, I don't know who wrote the, the, the final episode of the shooting. Mm-hmm. But I came into the office the next Monday, and the news, every news station, the, the phone rang about once a minute, and every news station was wanting interviews, and all the magazines, and Time Magazine, and everybody were calling and asking for um, what happened, who, who, who shot JR, yeah. and these producers who were old hands, they were just delighted. They really hadn't thought that it was going to blow up like that. Who shot JR was going to blow up and be the big event of the entire summer. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. And it was. I have some stories about that. Um, Go ahead. I had uh, a lawyer who I know Mm -hmm. called me and said, look, um, this is perfectly legal. You tell me who shot JR and and market your house and I'll go to London and put bets on it. <laughs> I said, I'm not going to tell you who shot JR. And um, I used to um, take private lessons in Malibu for, you know, physical 
Right. Uh, what do you call it? Physical therapy. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, exercises. And the woman's husband was a really tough guy. And he said, Lorraine, come into the, into the gym. And I thought, I don't want to go into the gym with him. Yeah. So I, I go into the gym and I think, oh, my God, all these, these uh, scary things like, you know, these weights and stuff. And he said, I want you to tell me who shot Jr. And I thought, if he, if he tries to kill me, I'll tell him. And he said, and I'm going to go and put it on, put, you know, a, a bet in Vegas. And I'll give you $50,000. And I said, I'm not going to tell you who shot Jr. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so people were trying to get it out of you then. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> Oh my God, that's priceless! Yeah, people are always asking Quentin Tarantino what's in that briefcase in Pulp Fiction. He won't tell nobody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, it turned into the highest-rated TV episode in history, tying with the final episode of Mash a couple years later. Um, uh, I, I'm sure you didn't expect the, the popularity of this to happen. Oh, it really did, uh, and. And what um, it was, the, the MASH was the highest episode in America. Right. But who shot JR? One out of every three people in London and in, in the Great Britain watched that show. Yeah. People in Afghanistan watched that show. Somebody said that they went to Bangladesh. And as they were coming, you know, they drove into Bangladesh. And as they uh, drove in, the guy at the, you know, um, you know, the guy at the border, yeah, asked him, "Who shot Jr.?" Yeah. <laughs> and I was interviewed in uh, for a magazine in France. I was interviewed for a magazine in Germany. Uh, and in fact, it helped me get a job in Germany. So, because I worked there for uh, for about a about a year for one of the big. Wow. And and when I was in China in two thousand, so that was twenty years later. The when we I went with women in film, so we went and we interviewed people in, uh, you know, all the movie business, in the, all the movie, uh, what they call the movie factories. Yeah. And television uh, stations they were all very interested in who shot JR yeah. <laughs> <China. laughs> last year I talked to Charlene Tilton and um, oh. when she hosted she? she's great um, she's oh where is she now I think she's in Louisiana as a matter of fact she's somewhere in the south right now hiding out you oh. know during COVID you know because LA is really really crazy you know um, she, yeah, she's finishing her biography, but, um, uh, when she hosted Saturday Night Live a few months after that, you know, uh, when she's saying her good night at the end, uh, Charles Rocket says to her, who the fuck shot Jr.? And he got fired that night for saying fuck. And the funny part is earlier in the evening, Prince was the musical guest. He sang a song in which he said fuck. And for some reason, He's never been credited as the first person to say fuck on Saturday Night Live, and yet nobody called him out, and he's been back many times since. It's weird. It's really weird. Yeah. Well, Prince was a star. Of course. Of course. Were, were you submitted for an Emmy? Uh, yeah, but, uh, you know, it, oh, I didn't get it. Damn it. <laughs> it wasn't considered, at the time, it was, it was considered, you know, tremendously popular. Right. But, um, you know, I don't know what got, who got the Emmy that year. Yeah. And was that, was that during the, the time of the writer's strike? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Powers Booth, he won the Emmy that year for playing Jimmy Jones in the biopic. He goes up there and he says... This is either the best moment of my life or the dumbest. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yeah. Oh, that, that's 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 so cool though, because you, you know one of the, one of the the great things about that episode is that it's a very well written episode. I mean, forget the iconic aura around it. You know, it was something that was so radical at the time because there was a risk, you know, of of Jr. not coming back, and yet he was one of the reasons why that show was so successful. Actually. Yeah, there was a risk of Jr. not coming back, but I don't think there was any realistic risk of that. He of course. had been out of work after he had done I Dream of Jeannie, and the producers were very aware of that, that he really wanted, he loved that show. He got, he was getting $50,000 an episode. Right. Which was more than anybody had, you know, gotten. Now they're getting a million dollars an episode. Yeah, I mean, after he did I Dream of Genie, you know, he he guest starred on so many shows where he was a bad guy because he wanted to, like, you know, just bury, you know, Major Nelson in the past, you know? He, I saw him play a bad guy on Columbo once, like, like a few years after I Dream of Genie had been over, you know? And then here he is playing, you know, the the guy that everyone loves to hate, you know, <laughs> on Dallas... And I, I interviewed this one actor. He was on a short-lived series on CBS in the 80s. He said that when he was on this show, he did a lot of things that he looks back now and can't believe he got away with. And amongst them was <clears throat> going to CBS affiliate parties with Larry Hagman. <laughs> you know, because they did a lot of partying in those days. Well, um, yeah, I, 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 I heard that when Larry... You know, Larry had a problem with alcohol. Yeah. And uh, when he came on the first day of shooting, um, he came in his cowboy, because he had, he, his, he had lived with his grandparents in Texas, so he had the boots and the hat and everything, and he really was right. a, a, a Texas guy. Right. So he comes with the boots and the hat, and over his shoulder he has... Um, what do you call it, those bags, uh, the bags filled with champagne. <laughs> champagne cases. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, you wrote a couple episodes of Chips. How was that? I loved Chips, and it was, the people there were so great. Even even though um, it was at the time when, when Estrada's ego kind of, you know, amplified and Larry Wilcox was gone? I thought Larry Wil... I don't remember. Um, but the producers and the people I dealt with, the mm -hmm. writing staff, they were just lovely. Mm -hmm. um, I only met Eric, Eric Estrada once, because I, I was not... I. I went on the set once or twice, but that was all. Mm -hmm. But was he nice when you met him? Oh, God, yes. That's interesting. Yeah, because I, I've I met a lot of people who guest starred on the show, and there was mixed responses, you know, but mostly negative. But Really? Yeah. Huh. It's just, you know, when that show, like, hit huge, you know, his, his management was was telling him things and he he was believing them you know he was believing in his own publicity because he knew you know how badly he struggled to get quality roles that weren't you know your stereotypical latino gang member roles you know yeah. that when he knew when he finally broke through with this rule he knew he had a responsibility to the community and he wasn't going to let anybody get in the way of it you know and it it alienated him from a lot of people on that set um from everything I've I've read and heard about. Yeah. That's 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 why fame is a bitch. <laughs> fame can be a bitch sometimes. You uh how about writing for you try to, to live up to it. Exactly. You got to live up to it, but you also got to be objective, you know, and make sure you're not hurting people because someday, you know, peop certain people will be in a position of power and then, you know, you, you might wind up, you know, kissing their ass, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How, how about uh, writing for Crime Story? <sighs> crime Story was hard because it was... Uh 
kind of... I think I wrote that episode overnight. Mm -hmm. It was very strange. They called me in and we talked about it and everything. And then I didn't get the go ahead and I didn't get the go ahead. And then finally I did and I had to write... I had to get it in like the next day. And so I stayed up all night and wrote. Uh, it was a very different experience. Yeah, it was Michael Mann. He's producing. Mann was yeah. He was a movie director. Right. Directed and Thief and Headhunter. Big pardon. He directed Thief and Headhunter and and or Manhunter, and then he um, he he had produced um, Miami Vice at that time, which was huge. It was gorgeous. I mean, the sets, the um, the wardrobe, everything about Miami Vice was terrific. But Crime Story was different. It was a much darker show. Uh, anyway, it was fine. The Bobby Roth directed the episode. I was supposed to interview him back in January, but he got a little weird with me in email, so I just said, okay, I'm going to pass. <laughs> You know, he yeah. he's a very talented director, though. Uh huh. So, so you direct you you interview actors and directors and actors, directors, okay. writers, comedians, uh, musicians, and um, you know, I sometimes I, I've cut back on this recently because there's a lot of competitiveness. I cut back on interviewing other podcasters. Oh really? Yeah, there's a lot of competitiveness and rivalry that goes on, you know, um, once you connect with them on Facebook after you've interviewed them and stuff. It's it, it's really strange. But, um, yeah, so I, I like to do a whole variety. Because when I first started the podcast, I was interviewing horror and science fiction uh, movie people at first. And then I wanted to diversify the podcast after a while because <clears throat> I had trouble getting certain uh, horror and sci-fi movie people after a while because I didn't have a following yet, so I just started diversifying uh, it. But I still interview horror and sci-fi people. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, I, I just want to keep old entertainment alive because we're at the age now where we have the internet, but people are not utilizing it the way it should be, especially younger people. So I want to keep the, the, um, the classic entertainment alive. It must be hard to do a um, podcast all the time. It is. Um, you do the one every week? I do several every week. Um, since the year began, I've cut back because, oh God, for a long time I was doing sometimes three a day, sometimes six days a week, and then I just got to a point where I, I let out a primal scream. <laughs> I just had to... I can understand. I had to cut back, Yeah. So I've done maybe four a week since the year began, and it's really suited me well. Four a week? Yeah. Wow. I went from eight to ten a week to four a week. <laughs> so your podcasts are on all the time then? Yeah. Wow. I do them, upload them, yep, and they're out there. I'm, oh. prob I'm probably the most prolific of this genre in terms of podcasting, you know, because most guys, they do one a week or maybe two a week tops. But me, yeah, I'm, I just constantly do it because there's nothing to do up here in Reading. It's, it's, a, it's a country area, you know, and I'm not a country yeah. boy. I'm a city boy. So, <clears throat> yep, yeah, it's been my life the last four years. Oh, wow. That must be hard for you. It's hard, but it's a lot of fun, and it's super easy. You know, I love I love I love doing the research part because I find things that I didn't know that I never heard them talking about in previous interviews. And when I bring it up, they're like, "Oh my God, you are a great interviewer!" Because no one's ever asked me that before. <laughs> wow! Yeah. <clears throat> you know, like for instance, you know, uh, you wrote you wrote an episode of Highlander. Does anybody ever ask you about that? Uh, no, actually, no. Uh, but yeah, it was Highlander was fun, and then when I was up in Canada with my husband mm -hmm. uh, doing Out of Limits, and um, I went on the set because I was writing it in Los Angeles, 
but they were shooting it in Canada. So it was great, and I got to talk to the people who were the sword fighting people. The, the person I found most interesting was the trainer, the sword fighting trainer, because mm -hmm. he had been an Olympic uh, sword, swordsman. Right. And that was fascinating. It was really fun. Did, did you ever see the movie? I, maybe. I don't remember it. I don't. Yeah, I think I must have, have, have screened one of the movies. I love I love the movie. I talked to a couple. I talked to the director from it earlier this year, and I talked to a, uh -huh. a, a stunt woman on it. Yeah, it's a great movie. Sean Connery's really great in it. No, I I've, I've never seen it. That's well, I, w I should really. Yeah, it's a really good movie. You're just amazing to do all this. Yeah. So so, what made you leave um, writing for TV and to writing novels? Oh well, I uh, I aged out, <laughs> so I started writing novels. And my first novel, the "Scandalous Summer of Sissy LeBlanc," was a national bestseller, um, and it's a very funny book. And then it spawned the Southern Bell's Handbook. It was so successful that HarperCollins wanted to bring out Sissy's rules for uh, life because it was at the beginning of the women's movement. Well, it wasn't the beginning of it, but people were not as... And I wanted to say, you know, calm down. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can get what you want, and you have to go out. You have to make your own life. But don't be so serious about it. Um, how to, and so there are a lot of tips on how to, how to handle men, you know. Mm -hmm. A smart girl lets him know, lets a man take full credit for doing exactly what she wants him to do. Yeah. And um, you can't change the past, but a smart girl won't let that stop her. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, um, and this is sort of old fashioned now because we've come so far, but mm -hmm. it's okay for a woman to know her place. She just shouldn't stay there. And uh, so I really liked writing novels because I could, I could just create my own people and my own life, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I've been writing two books since the year began. One's about my love of cult movies and, um, you know, partly about, you know, how I got here and podcasting and stuff. And then I wrote a, um, a trivia book, um, too. Oh, and, wow, I bet you're really good at that. Did you, were you able to get it published? Well, I'm, I'm going to hold that off for a while because I'm paying off a debt right now and I can't um, make any more money than I'm already on, on disability, you know. But, oh. but um, it is it is in the works. I mean, the book it's far from over. I got to keep going. I've been taking the summer off from writing it though because I did a lot of crying for about five months while I was writing it because I I, I reveal a lot of personal stuff in this book that I had never told anybody before. You know about you know where I was when I saw this movie and what happened to me and where where it brings me back to when I see it. You know, and. I just, I just want to hold off on crying, you know, for a while because sure. you can't cry all the time, you know. So I've been uh, taking yeah. a break from that. Yeah, but I do plan on getting it published, you know, in the next, you know, at least a couple of years. It's a tough business right now, writing books. Yeah. I know a couple of people I talked to, they had trouble getting their books published during the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, there's the uh, self-publishing now on uh, Amazon.com that uh, I'm I, I'm most likely gonna see what I can do with that, you know, in the I future. Know, getting, you just, uh, if if you don't mind, I will, it, I think you should try to get published by a major publishing company first. 
Really? You think that would be better? Well, it's, yeah. They pay you money. Yeah. <laughs> money. Exactly. If, if you publish yourself on Amazon, it's really hard to get readers. You have to do your own publicity. Um, I do my own publicity anyway, so... <laughs> well, of course you do. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and plus, you know, um, you know, I've been trying to get into um, horror and comic con, co horror and comic cons. You know, I mean, if I had a book, you know, I'd be able to go to you know a con and sell it, you know, for thirty bucks or That's whatever. True. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd be able to do that. But getting a getting a table, I, I mean, I tried, I've tried getting a table at conventions for this podcast, and even that's been tough. You know, because they look at your uh, followers and your algorithms and all that bullshit. So, you know, hopefully in the future I'll be able to get one. You know, I'm not giving up. I was actually supposed to host a panel at a convention in September, but it's at the time of my mother's open heart surgery, so I'm going to have to miss it. You really have had some problems, I mean. Just... A lot. On. I keep I keep going on and on. You know the show must the show must go on. You know my mom yeah. she, she had a brain hemorrhage last summer, right? Oh no! Luckily, it happened on a, on a day. It, ha it happened on a weekend, right? Where I had like maybe three days off from the podcast, right? I cried those three days, and then I went on and did my interviews because the show must go on. You know, there's there's nothing I could do. She she you know she recovered. She had surgery. She was okay, but <clears throat> I had to go on because if I didn't, you know, I could have slipped back into alcoholism. You know, which led to my car accident. You know. Are you able to monetize your your uh, podcast? No, I don't monetize my podcast because, like I said, I can't have another income right now. Okay. Uh, so I was curious. I read on your um, bio on your website you wrote your first novel when you were in sixth grade. Yeah. So why did it take so long to do it again? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so you wrote a you wrote a novel about pirates? Oh yes. Was at, at, in sixth grade. Mm -hmm. you know all about pirates. Well, were you going to see swashbuckling movies? <laughs> <laughs> Errol Flynn? <laughs> <laughs> the reviews in my family were the child needs her head examined. Oh yeah, in those days, <laughs> that's that was the common response. If you came from a non-showbiz, non-creative family, they would say, "Oh, he, he needs to go. See, he or she needs to go see a doctor." <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> My grandmother, you know, you know, she she was like that. You know, I was always performing in front of the family, you know, after dinner and stuff, and she would say, "Oh, you need to take him to a doctor." <laughs> No, she she cared about me a lot, you know, but she was old school. Yeah. Very old school. So, do you have a new a new uh, novel that you're working on right now? Uh, not right now. Not right now. I'm just not very inspired right now. I think maybe it's the COVID, maybe it's the lockdown. My husband is coming out with a novel, and... And when it, he does, you should interview him because he's also done a tremendous amount of television. Oh, nice, nice. What's his name? Carlton East Lake. Carlton East Lake. Okay. Yeah, just just let me know. Um, you know when he's when he's got it coming out. I'll definitely you know interview him. Yeah. And I don't say that too often now. I'm I've, I've been very picky with who I interview if I'm not familiar with them. I had a stalker back in March. Oh, good Lord. Oh, somebody who wanted to be on your show? Yeah, so, okay, this, it, it was ironic. So, um, there was, there was a horror movie from the 70s I really, really liked, and I was trying to find somebody from it, and this guy approached me, and it turns out he wrote the story of it, right? 
and I, I didn't put two and two together, so because uh, I was going through something at the time, right? And I, I, I thought he was getting a little aggressive, so I blocked him, but then a colleague of mine interviewed him, and I was like, wait a minute, he's legit? And he's like, uh, yeah, and he's like, yeah, he wrote that movie. I was like, oh, okay, and so then I unblocked him, and then I interviewed him, but he came on my show with an agenda. He was stalking an actress I interviewed that he worked with um, a few years ago that he got really aggressive with, and so then after the interview, he just, you know, he called me like at like odd hours of the night. He just did a lot of, you know, horrible stuff. You know, he was like messaging me all the time. So I just blocked him and I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm never going through that again. That's scary. That really is scary. It is. You know, I, I mean, I feel bad for the guy. At some point, he probably got a head injury or something or he was born with one. You know, I mean, I, I talked to the guest of mine that he was stalking and she's like yeah he he he's he's crazy she's like that's why i haven't been on facebook for like a year now because it's just he's he's always bothering me so yeah she had to you know get people involved and stuff sad it's really really sad so you don't so you don't have anything that you're working on not right now i'm being you know at some point if you're really a creative person yeah. Downtown. And I'm, I'm taking some downtime and swimming and taking care of my family and just taking care of myself. That's good. I do yoga. It's very important to do that, I think, if you're, if you're really going to be creative. I agree. I agree. So I have a couple jokes for you. Awesome. You know the difference between a golf ball and a G-spot? No. A man rather spend 20 minutes looking for a golf ball. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> yes. Uh, what, what do you call a boy that doesn't masturbate? I don't know. But... A liar. <laughs> <laughs> on your podcast? Oh yeah, it's it's a staple of the show. I tell jokes at the end. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I hope uh, you're not embarrassed by that. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> well, Lorraine, I want to thank you so much for being my 1300th guest today and well, thank you for interviewing me. Absolutely. And yeah, let, let me know um, when your husband's book is coming out. I'll I'll proudly interview him. Oh, I'm glad because he's he's had a big career on television. Are you? How long is how long is the podcast? Oh, I just do the I just do you know the interviews right. They go um, and you know they 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 vary. It depends on how good of a storyteller the person is, you know, or you uh -huh. know if they give me short answers or anything. That's how basically the the how long the podcast goes and how prolific they are too. My pleasure. Thanks. You you have yourself a great day, and please stay safe. Thank you. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, there you have it. L Lorraine Dupree. Ain't she a sweetheart? What a great lady, huh? I'm so glad that um, we could have a conversation today that was both deep and meaningful like that. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, There's no shame and living in the past, because the present sucks. Later, dudes!